candidate for Congress in the Hi everyone, my name is Marilyn Strickland and I'm a candidate for Congress in the 10th District of Washington State. I'm the former mayor of Tacoma and this is our weekly Facebook Live event. And tonight we are talking about UBI or Universal Basic Income. I'm very excited to have some very special guests here tonight. We have Mayor Michael Tubbs of Stockton, California. We have my mayor, Victoria Woodards. And then we have Scott Santons here, who's actually an expert in UBI. And so, you know, when we talk about UBI or universal basic income, what exactly does it mean? It's basically about putting cash in people's hands. And when I think about why I became interested in UBI, I really started thinking about this COVID-19 crisis that we're in, how it is changing people's lives, how it's changing the economy, how people have had challenges getting their unemployment benefits or even some of the PPP funds. And so as we look at what this economy will look like after COVID, that's really what got me interested in UBI. I started doing research about it. I have had conversations with Humanity Forward, which is presidential candidate Andrew Yang's effort, and really started thinking carefully about, you know, what would it mean if every person got $1,000 a month, no questions asked, no strings attached, no litmus test, and how would that affect people's lives and their economies? And I'm gonna ask you all who are here watching a question later today, but I have a very special guest first, and I call him a pioneer, a bold person, who is the mayor of Stockton, California, Michael Tubbs, and he's actually doing a pilot program in his city with universal basic income. So I'd like to welcome the mayor, and please tell us about why you chose to do this, how long the program has lasted, and just give us some details about why you thought this was good public policy, Mayor. Yeah, well, thank you, Mayor Strickland. I'm so excited about your candidacy and the leadership you've shown on the campaign trail, which makes me very excited for the leadership you will show once you're elected in Congress with your all's help. And good to see you, Mayor Woodard, one of the best mayors in the country. And I say that because I'm around her and all the other mayors and she continually stands out for her love for people, her clarity of thought, and her just level-headedness and humility. And Scott, always great to see you um, on Twitter, on Zoom. I've been doing and talking about this for many years. I hope you feel excited that your work has really helped push this into a conversation that's on the fringe of American political thought, but, but then in the center. Um, so as Mayor Strickland said, my name is Michael Tubbs. I'm the mayor of Stockton, California. And I actually learned about basic income or the concept of guaranteed income through reading Dr. King. And where do we go from here? Chaos Our Community, which was written in 1967 at a time very similar to this one. There was massive uprisings and civil unrest in cities throughout the country. And in that backdrop, he thought about how a lot of the protests were about kind of structural violence, about the violence of poverty and about the racial wealth gaps and, and the ways in which in the richest country in the world, where now at this point, the top one-tenth of 1% control 90% of wealth of this country, how we have to do better particularly as we think about what a civilized and evolved society should look like. Um, and he talked about that we try to abolish poverty through housing, which is important. People should be able to afford housing. Mm -hmm. That we try to abolish poverty through education, that we try to ab abolish poverty through um, healthcare. And all those things are important and necessary. And he said, but oftentimes they're stigma, they're not coordinated. And the quicker, the best way to abolish poverty is the most direct, um, through a guaranteed income. And I remember reading that and being fascinated because I had never heard that discussed as part of King's legacy. And now in 2020, we're in this even a more, a more difficult situation because you have the civil unrest, but you also have this global pandemic that we haven't seen since 1918. And I'm reminded of how last time we had a great depression, which we're walking into, that was preceded by a global health crisis. FDR was big and bold and came out with a new deal, right. a new social contract, a new social safety net. And we can't operate in 2020 just with the 1930 social contract that we have to update it for this century and a guaranteed income has to be part of that. So all that was to say in 2017, um, we launched the Stockton Economic Empowerment Demonstration where we gave $500 a month to 125 randomly selected residents um, to test this idea. And what we found is that people spend money just how you and I spend money. Right. And the issue isn't that people aren't working. People are working incredibly hard. They're working in jobs that don't afford them the dignity of paid time off, of family time, of sick days, et cetera. And they're working harder than ever, two or three jobs and still can't pay for basic necessities. Before COVID-19, 
one in two Americans cannot afford one $500 emergency. And right. what we saw in, in, in giving money to people, it really challenged some of my assumptions. Because at first I said, well, if people worked, they would have money. And then I found that no, far too many people in our communities are working and they look like they have it all together, but are struggling on their debt, are taking care of family members, are, are, yep. are, are, are trapped in crazy mortgages and just really struggling to make it month by month. Um, the second thing I learned is that there's a lot of work that is done, particularly by women, particularly by women of color that isn't compensated. And that right. if you look at the childcare costs in this country, it actually is cheaper for uh, uh, anybody, but usually a woman to stay at home rather than work at McDonald's and take care of their kids because right. that the cost of the minimum wage is not enough to pay for childcare. And if she did that work outside of her home, she would be compensated. If she did it literally next door, yeah. she would be compensated. But because she does it for herself and her family, she's not. And that's work. And that work deserves to be seen and rewarded. And that this misnomer that people aren't working is so false. The yeah. majority of people that can work, do work. The biggest group of people not working are children because we have child labor laws. And the other people who aren't working are because they have a disability. Right. Or they're too they're retired. Yeah. Or, or et cetera. So people are working, the economy isn't working. Um, and then the third thing I found in the pilot was that I had this notion that jobs gave dignity, that, that the dignity of work, that dignity comes from work. And now I'm persuaded that's part of the issue. The issue is that dignity has to be attached to humanity first or humanity forward, as Mr. Yang's organization is called, meaning that if we treated, if we understood that dignity was inherent in people, we wouldn't force them to work in undignified conditions. I'm thinking now of the folks in my community who are working as essential workers yeah. during a global health crisis and still have to stand in line in food banks because they don't have enough money after working, putting their health, their family's health on the line to pay for the basic necessities of food. I think we'll look back 50 years from now and say the society that tolerated such poverty and such lack was actually barbaric. That, that That's not who we are and who we can be. And there's paths to get there. So I'll, I'll, I'll conclude by saying the money was spent, so we did 18 months of looking at how the money was spent. Okay. The, the money was spent in the ways you and I and you on Facebook spent money the past month. Okay. So food, um, yep. utilities. Yep. Um, and some people did buy nice Thanksgiving dinners for their family, and I'm so happy <laughs> they did that. That's all right. It puts money back <laughs> in the economy, right? <laughs> um, Absolutely. Some, and, and, and two stories really stand out. One from a, a young lady who said, that the $500 enough, a month was enough for her to smile. And I was like, well, everyone gets happy when they get money. And then the researchers told me like, no, Mayor, she needed dentures for two years. She wow. couldn't afford them. So she just refused to smile. And when the first $500, she was able to purchase dentures, like dignity, to be able to smile. And another from a gentleman, Tomas, who said the $500 was enough for him to interview. And I was confused. I said, see, they said, we gave you money. You will make crazy decisions. Why would you pay $500 for an interview? And he <laughs> said, no, I work retail. I don't get to take time off right. without losing money. So I was always wanting to apply for something bigger and better, but I was scared because I have kids. I can't lose the three, $400. He said, but the $500, I was able to take a bet on myself, interview for a job, got the job with union protection, with stable hours, and I was able to spend more time with his kids and, and pay for tutoring. And then during COVID, one young lady talked about how, how you mentioned, um, Mayor Strickland, that she was laid off through no fault of her own. She was working. She had right. a job. Right. She was laid off, not because she was fired, but because they laid her off. She applied for unemployment insurance and still hasn't been able to access it. It's been right. three months. Right. But luckily, she says, thank God for the $500 because I'm not too far behind on my bills. I'm not. I, I was already starting off a little behind, but I'm not all the way um, back there. So again, Mayor Strickland, I thank you for your leadership. I know Mayor Woodards and I are, are part of a group called Mayors for Guaranteed Income, where we're saying as mayors, we are committed to testing and piloting because folks need to see right. what happens. We're happy to do that. And at the same time, we do, we're do we doing that. We're also advocating for policies that are right now in the Congress and in the Senate that would give cash to folks $2,000 a month um, and Senator Harris's bill, $2,000 a month, I think, as well, and mm -hmm. um, Rep. Ryan's and, and Rep. Connor's bill to give to everyone during this pandemic, because I'll end with this. We live in a time of pandemics. So if this year is COVID, but next year it's an earthquake. The year after, it's, it's, it's a fire. And a guaranteed income allows us to build a firm foundation to buy a floor 
and buy boots and buy shoestrings so we can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, but also to build economic resilience. Because it's not if a pandemic happens. Unfortunately, in times we live in, it's when a pandemic happens. Um, so again, yeah. Mayor Strickland, I'm excited for your candidacy. Looking forward to your work, Mayor Woodards, and, and, and working with you to do a pilot in Tacoma. And Scott, I thank you for your thought leadership um, on this issue and continuing us to push to get to as universal as possible to as quickly as possible. Well, thank you so much for your very thoughtful and eloquent description of this. You know, when we think about where the economy was pre-COVID, that was not a normal economy. We know that there have been structural issues and structural inequities that existed before COVID. And what COVID did was just completely expose them. And, you know, one of the examples that I often use is that after the Civil War, people who were freed slaves were promised and denied land grants. Mm -hmm. And they were denied those land grants. And I think about what would the situation be for a lot of African-American families today if we had benefited from that intergenerational wealth that we were denied. The other thing I talk about as well, you brought up, Mark, you brought up Dr. King, is that you know, he was, he's known as someone who talked about social justice. But in his last days, he talked about economic justice. And he said that economic justice is just as important as social justice. And he even back then, he said, the world is changing technology is changing, the place of work is changing. Dr. King said this in the 60s, and here we are today talking about technology, structural issues, and all the things that we know we need to do. So when I think about why I support UBI, we have huge structural issues that have not been addressed for a long time. And this is one way, especially during this period in time in America, where we have a chance to do some policies that maybe would have been a very hard, heavy lift. And when I think about UBI, this is not to supplant anything. We still need to raise a minimum wage. We still need paid family leave. We still need to look at discrimination when it comes to housing and lending. I mean, there's still things that are very important, but for me, this is the context of economic security, trying to get people on the road to building wealth that they can do that. But it's just you know a floor of dignity that people I believe deserve. And one of the things that I hear people say is like, well, you know, if you just give it to everybody, you're gonna have all this waste and all this abuse and all these things. And one question I'm going to pose to some of our you know, people who are with us today is, you know, what would you do with $1,000 a month? And mm -hmm. post your answers, because I want to collect them and get some ideas, because for a lot of people, it's not what you think it is. And so I would not turn this over now to my mayor, Mayor Woodards. And I'm so excited. This is really funny. When I talked about UBI and doing pilot programs across the country, I did that about two weeks ago. Been talking about it about a month or two. And then I see that the U.S. Commerce of Mayors, during your summer meeting, I know how this goes, you guys came out with mayors for basic income or, or whatever you're calling it. And so talk to me, my mayor, about why you thought this was a good idea and why you think Tacoma can benefit from this. Well, thank you. I'm your mayor, but you'll always be my mayor. <laughs> and, 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 and let me say, Scott, what a Pleasure to meet you. Look forward to uh, getting hearing you this evening. But I also want to thank my good good friend uh, Mayor Tubbs for joining yeah. us this evening and and for bringing this forward. Yeah. You know, it's not been something I, I've been watching Mayor Tubbs since I since since we met, watching this happen in his city, and um, and had so much going on in Tacoma that we were really focused on that. But when he reached out to say, "Hey, I'm putting together um, this mayor's for guaranteed income. Would you like to join?" and I was like, "Not only would I like to, I felt like I had to." When we talk about the time that we're in right now, what's happening, and all of these conversations around police reform, mm -hmm. um, I am convinced over, especially over the last couple of weeks, um, that we can't just focus on police reform. It doesn't make any sense to build the best criminal justice system just to put more people in it. Right. We need to look at every system mm -hmm. that, that disproportionately affects African-Americans and other people of color to say, you know what? We need to fix those systems to keep people out of the criminal justice system. And, and fixing those systems means giving people everything they need to be successful. And so while we haven't started a project in Tacoma yet, I wanted to sign out number one, number one, to learn more about it. Yep. Um, but number two, to begin to push it at the, at the federal level, because we know in order for it to, to happen um, across the United States, because I'm not just interested in what happens in Tacoma, I'm interested in what happens in every community. Um, as we say, when we, when we all do better, we all do better. And that, doesn't, that means if you live in California or Washington, it, it all affects one another. So 
for me, it seemed like, well, you can't be talking about reform and, and, and really transformation without bringing in some new innovative ideas about how to address those inequities. And um, this seemed like a perfect way to begin a conversation about how we level the playing field. We've been talking about equity for a long time, Marilyn, yep. you and I, when we were on the council, started the Office of Equity and yep. Human Rights. Yep. And, 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 but we're not gonna truly change the outcomes until people have an opportunity to support themselves and their families. The other thing I'll add real quickly is we've been doing this work, we did it at the Urban League, Mm -hmm. um, but we've been doing this work with United Way in Pierce County who talks about Alice. Right. And Alice's asset, limited, income constraint, and employed. And what that means is that if the person, as, as Mayor Tubbs just said, who gets up every day to go to work, but still doesn't make enough money to fully care for themselves and their family. And what we know about Pierce County is that in over half of the cities in Pierce County, 30% of the people in those cities are Alice. Yeah. That's a lot of people in this county. So I'm excited to get Marilyn elected um, because she's gonna represent a good portion of Pierce County and everyone in Pierce County needs a fair shot at being able to take care of themselves and their families. And I think this is a good way to do it. Well, great. Well, thank you very much, mayors, for your comments. And, you know, you talked about the mechanics of how this works. And there have been a lot of questions. You know, some people have said, well, is it limited by a certain income level? I know that when Andrew Yang talks about it, he says, no, everybody gets $1,000 a month. You know, and I pose this question to some folks I know who are not struggling. They're doing very well. And I just said, I said, what do you think about this idea of universal basic income? And they said, you know, given the times we're in, we don't think it's a bad idea. And I said, well, how do you feel as someone who you wouldn't typically think would need universal basic income? I said, what would you do with that money? And a friend of mine said, I'd pay off my son's student loans. <laughs> and, and, and the things that people said they would do were all things that would help uplift others or put money back into the economy. And I said to folks, even if you decide to go out to a fancy dinner, you're still putting money back into the economy. I mean, that's the whole thing. People with spending power, it, it's good for the economy. Yeah. So at this point, I would like to turn this over to Scott now. And let's just talk about, you know, how you got into becoming an expert on UBI and also just some of the tech. Do you have to go, Mayor? I do. There's another UBI town hall with <laughs> for guaranteed income founding member Libby Schaff at 550. Oh my God, the mayor of Oakland. Tell her I said hello. <laughs> And we'll uh, you're, not, you're, not going to, you're not going to be with another congressional candidate, are you? No, no, no. I'm okay, all, all right. in for another strictly for Congress. I'm all in. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mayor. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for your leadership. All right, well, Scott, let's get into some of the technical aspects because, you know, you talk about something like UBI and mm -hmm. people have said to me, okay, Marilyn, that sounds really nice, but how are you going to pay for it? And so talk a bit about the philosophy of why you think UBI makes sense and then maybe some of the different ways to pay for it. And you and I had a conversation before this about how the money actually recirculates in a way. So Scott, mm -hmm. Scott is an expert on UBI. Welcome and please tell us a bit. <laughs> yeah, well, th thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, be a part of this discussion. And um, yes, yeah, so first of all, it's funny when we get asked this question, how do you pay for basic income? Um, first of all, I just like to ask the question, uh, get people to ask, is poverty free? Like, what is the cost of poverty? Yeah. And when you look at the cost of poverty, then the cost of poverty are actually extreme. The, the cost of poverty alone is over a trillion dollars a year. Child poverty alone. Child poverty alone is over a trillion dollars a year. And of course, this feeds into, you know, the cost of crime, the cost of ill health, like all of these things compound each other and it's extremely expensive. So mm -hmm. it's like, we think that it doesn't cost anything to not have basic income, but that's false. It, it's very expensive. So another way to look at this too, is if we look and, and see where we were uh, in the seventies and, and if we had not increased inequality since then, then everyone right now would be effectively earning an extra $12,000 a year. So this idea too is of, of how do we pay for it? It's like, well, actually it's being taken from you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like this is something that you should have, but inequality has increased greatly and all of the productivity growth over all these years is going straight up to the top. And so it's really a matter of making sure that that productivity growth is actually going downwards to the rest of us to create that floor. 
And so it's not just about, you know, this thinking of, of like, how can we somehow afford this? It, it, it's a, it's a understanding that it's ours and we have essentially a right to it. And it's about making sure that, that we just make that choice to build that floor. But for, As, I, want, I want you to repeat what you just said. Talk about the 70s again and, and what we didn't gain and how there's, there's a $12,000 a year deficit. Because I think that's a really interesting point. I never viewed it that way. Yeah, yeah. So you can look at this as it's called the great decoupling. And so if you run around 1973, if you look at the chart of uh, productivity growth and wages, then prior to 1973, those grew at the same rate. And then after 1973, wages effectively flatlined, adjusted for inflation, mm -hmm. while productivity continued to grow. So we are actually more than twice as productive as we were in 1973. And are we working half as much now? No, we're not. Uh, are we like consuming twice as much? No, we're not. Uh, all of that growth went to essentially the very top. And so this is a, if you look at that kind of chart, that gap is what pays for basic income. Interesting. Thank you for that. So um, I do want to take a couple questions from folks, and then I want to get back into another conversation. So Ray says, and I think I asked about this, what are some of the funding sources and tax reforms that mm -hmm. would prevent reductions in other social assistance programs and provide sustainable funding? Because I know that sometimes when you, I read a lot of articles about UBI lately, and some mm -hmm. of them say that, well, if there's UBI, then we will stop program X or stop program Y. And what I said was, it's about supplementing, not supplanting. And so talk a bit about how of uh, some funding models you've seen for this. And thank you for the question, Ray. Yeah, so um, first of all, like uh, this is about building a floor. And so once you have that floor, of course, that foundation enables us to build other things on top of it that work better, it's stronger. Uh, so things like healthcare, uh, that works better with basic income because of course, so much of the of our health outcomes around 80 to 90 percent are from the social determinants of health right and so if you create a healthier society then you actually save a lot of money on health care and same with education like you you can't really focus on your school as a child if you're going to school with an empty stomach if your parents are fighting at home every time because they're stressed out about say utilities are not finances on. right yeah. all that stuff so it, then you, know, you put all this money in education and then the kids end up, you know, barely they fail or they get through with like C's or D's or whatever. And what we want is to make sure that that environment, we improve the environment so that the, what we invest in education actually does better for everybody. Yeah. And, um, but there are also some programs, I think TANF is a good example mm -hmm. of a program where we, it was a really bad idea, I think. I think the welfare reform that Bill Clinton did, um, this, this block grant system to states it just, it doesn't work. It doesn't get to people. It's utilized in all sorts of ways. And it actually has, a study has shown that it has increased the racial wealth gap um, mm -hmm. between white and black kids. Um, so it's actually increasing inequality, this program. So I think TANF is a great example of a program that actually should just be converted into UBI. But I think mm -hmm. that there are other programs that should not be touched or should be, you know, reformed in some way. But for the most part, yeah, we're looking about building a floor. And then also it's about recognizing that we have these kind of invisible forms of welfare, which is say the earned income tax credit, the right. child tax credit, uh, the home mortgage interest rate deduction, all of the subsidies and deductions and allowances and everything in the tax code Almost that same. actually mostly goes to like the middle income and even the high income. Um, we should look at that and go, hey, is it right that say that we're effectively writing a check for a millionaire to be able to uh, afford a bigger mansion by giving them like a $30,000 tax credit every year uh, mm -hmm. for their mansion mortgage. <laughs> like maybe we shouldn't do that and instead say, right, let's get rid of that $30,000 mansion mortgage tax credit and instead just provide them that $12,000 like everybody else. And then that way they would actually be paying more than they are now. Uh, but in a clear way, they would be actually be seeing that they too are getting something just like everybody else, instead of thinking that, oh, this is my money and I'm just keeping more of my money when it's not that way at all. Yeah. Uh, but then like a VAT is, is like a, a value added tax. That's something that Andrew Yang talked about. Um, that's a very successful uh, tool in other countries. It's, it's, it's really widely used throughout the world. Will you explain how that works for people? 
Yeah, so it's kind of like a, it's a consumption tax. It's, it's, it's like a sales tax. So you would experience it as a, a sales tax, but it's something that goes on every step of the way from um, producing a good to the finished good. Okay. So each step actually pays a slice of that tax. And then the next one um, also pays a slice and then kind of deducts what the previous slice is. Um, and the, the, that kind of, it makes it harder to game. It makes it harder to avoid that tax because effectively everyone is making sure that each other is paying the tax. So it's a, it works really well um, comparative to like say just the IRS making sure that that the end consumer pays the tax. So um, this is something that would actually so, so, so effectively it's manu- So it's something that, manu- for example, if you're manufacturing something that that would apply during the production process? Yeah, so let's say you are growing corn. And so uh, you sell that corn to someone who's going to like turn it into cornmeal or whatever. So then that transaction is taxed, let's say at 10%. And then that uh, step of the process then converts like the, uh, they sell the cornmeal to someone who converts the cornmeal into like crackers or something. And so then that transaction is taxed as well. And so each step along the way, you're, you're having that transaction. And so at the, at the end of it, you have, let's say, this 10% uh, tax that the consumer pays, but also that has been paid each step along the way. Mm-hmm. So that's something, it's a way of getting, say, your Amazons of the world who are not paying federal income taxes to actually make sure that, that we get a slice of what their, um, their revenue that we're not getting right now. Interesting. So Mayor Woodards, I want to ask you a question. I mean, you, you, know, you joined this movement with Mayor Tubbs, and if you could think about three things you would like to see happen when Tacoma does a pilot program. Let's say Tacoma does a pilot program for 18 months and you select 300 residents to receive this $1,000, whatever the amount is you decide, whether it's yeah. 500 or 1,000. What, what do you, I mean, what do you hope to learn and what would you hope to see happen? I mean, is there something that you want to prove is true or are you just like, you know, let's, let's just see how they go, this goes. What are your desired outcomes here? Well, the, a couple. I mean, one we've already we already know from what Stockton has done. You know, the big one of the big questions about this for most people is what are people going to spend the money on? They're going to buy things they don't need, right? And what we found in, in obviously in as as Mayor Tubb said, is the fact that people spend it on things like food and rent and the and the very basics. So I think I'd like to prove that for Tacoma as well. What you know where people actually spend it. The other thing that I'm really um, interested in learning and, and as and as Stockton finishes its program. No, but the other thing I'd really like to know is how does it really help? Yeah. You know, what what kind of difference does it really make in the lives of those who have access to it? And I would also say that if we were going to do a pilot program in Tacoma, I would really think about um, what zip codes we would launch the pilot in. Mm -hmm. Um, And and although universal basic income means everybody gets it. Yeah. If we're going to launch a pilot, I obviously would want to launch that pilot in the neighborhoods who need it the most. So mm-hmm. using equity as a lens as how we would actually make this work in Tacoma. And I think those are probably the three things I, I would want to focus on and then and then study it and see what the outcomes are. Um, yeah. Because I think there's so much we could learn, right? If, right. if parents weren't stressed about paying rent, maybe they could spend more time and, and didn't have to work three jobs. Maybe right. they could spend time with their kids and go to parent teacher conferences and maybe that 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 actually makes grades look better that makes kids feel better I mean I think there's so much that we could measure um, that I I really like I I think that's one of the great things about the work that is happening in Stockton is that they've got some really great evaluation partners who are going to look at at, at, at the changes or the impacts that it makes. And I'd love to see across the board, all of the things that it changes and not just get wrapped up in the actual dollar itself, right? but how, how it really changes the lives of the people who have an opportunity to receive it. Yeah, well, and, and also too, I mean, you know, just the cost of doing nothing. And, you know, we all know that, you know, poverty is expensive. Yeah, heck yeah. So, yeah, I mean, and it's, 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 it, it's a form of psychological violence in many ways. And so I know that in the reading that I've been doing, it talks about just the peace of mind that people have. Not that it's gonna solve every problem that they have, but the peace of mind that you have and how that just gives you this floor to understand you know, what, what, how you can go about your business. And so can you talk about some of the social psychological benefits of having UBI? Because I've been reading a lot about that too, Scott. Yeah, so it, 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 it's, when you look at it and understand that, that 
it's not just money. Like no. it's really, it's a superficial understanding to think of it as money. The, the most powerful element of basic income is actually the unconditionality. So it, it's knowing that no matter what happens and no matter what your circumstances, that you know that say on the first of next month that you're getting this amount of money. And that, that creates a sense of security and it creates a sense of, of power um, you know, when I say power, that's really important too, because it's a, it's a power to say no and yeah. say the freedom to say yes, the power to say no to employers who would say, I'm going to offer you this much money. It's minimum wage. It's say $8 an hour. And if you have no power to say no to that, then you have to say yes. And so there's actually a lot of coercion involved. And that's that lack of bargaining power is actually pushing down on wages. Um, but if you have that power to say no, and you can withhold your labor until the actual conditions are right, then that means they need to pay more money in order to get your labor. They need to improve the conditions. They need to improve the hours. Mm -hmm. So it's very powerful to understand that it's almost like a, it's a redistribution of power from the top to say the bottom and middle. And you know also mm -hmm. it's trust. Yep. And so it, when I, it's a redistribution of trust. And that's really interesting, too, because you look at, say, the Finland experiment and uh, the Canadian experiment in Ontario, um, a couple of those showed that actually it increased trust in government, in politicians, in each other. And right now, I feel that we're like in a crisis of trust. Like we right. are absolutely losing trust in government. And so if we can do something like that, where people feel like, oh, my gosh, government actually works and works for me and trusts me then that can really actually change society in a, in a profound way beyond what people are thinking. You know, and I think about the, um, the business case for this because I come back to, you know, nothing is better for our local businesses or businesses of all sizes, consumers with spending power and financial yeah. stability. I also think about the fact that there are populations that are not securely banked. And so mm -hmm. if you have $1,000 a month coming in through direct deposit, now you can be securely banked and not being securely banked keeps you from doing so many things that we consider essential, getting housing, getting you know, your utility turned on, all those things. And so there's even a case to be made for, this is how you keep people securely banked. And that is another step toward becoming more financially stable. And Absolutely. Yeah. Like it, it, it's funny if it, there's like, so there's so many experiments out there that you can already <laughs> learn from. Right. And, and some of the interesting ones. So um, in, in Namibia and India where this, uh, we did like full UBI pilots, um, we see entrepreneurship increases over and over right. again. So mm -hmm. in, in Namibia, uh, self-employment increased 301%. Wow. And in, in India, uh, villages where it was received were actually, there were three times as so many businesses as the control villages. And so part of that is not only essentially providing capital to entrepreneurs, but it's right. also creating a customer base so yeah. that actually those businesses succeed. That's right. And on the flip side, there was, it's funny when you look at like the people who don't like basic income, like who are the ones that, that, that lose out on it? And one of them is money lenders. So they really did not like how people would no longer accept say a thousand percent interest loans, <laughs> you know, because oh, people didn't need that lenders, anymore. Yes. Right. So payday loan lenders are not going to be happy with this because of the fact, again, that you actually can bank, you no longer need to pay to cash your checks. You no longer need to take out small loans and hope to get your next paycheck. Like you know that's gonna happen there and you can actually keep so much of your, more of your money because we don't see that as a tax right now. Right. Um, then it, it totally is. It even That's even true for like say the earned income tax credit where right. it's actually, you're essentially paying say, you know, a 10, 12, 13% tax to get your money because you're not banked and you have to like pay someone to um, do your taxes, pay someone to cash your check, like all this stuff. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, you know, one of the reasons that I thought about this being important is like, you know, I think about the 10th congressional district that I'm going to represent. And, you know, it is not Seattle. It's not King County. But there are people who are migrating here from different parts of the state. And as this region grows, we want to make sure that people don't get squeezed out because they can't afford to live here. Housing is a big part of my platform, and that's another topic for another day. But this is about having the means to afford to live. And this is why I put transportation and housing going together. Now, this community in the 10th district is not as urban as parts of Tacoma and parts of Seattle. It's definitely more spread out. It has more of a suburban feel, but people still have needs, whether it's an urban community, a suburban community, or a rural community. And so when I think about wanting to represent this district 
and what we can do to improve the quality of life for every person who calls it home and who will call it home one day. I just think that UBI is something that's great. And I will tell you, when I started this journey about talking about UBI and doing pilot programs across the country, I did not know that my mayor was going to decide that she wanted to be one of the cities. And so, I mean, and we did not plan this. I swear to God, we did not plan this. This this just kind of happened organically, but it shows you that great minds think alike, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so with that said, um, you know, for those of you who are watching, I'm asking the question, what would you do with $1,000 more a month? Tell us how you'd use that money because we don't have the function of you know, direct chat right here, but I want to hear that in your responses. And again, you know, I want to thank my guests for being here. I do think that universal basic income, we have a dozen mayors around the country. And I believe that Bill Peduto, the mayor of, of Pittsburgh, just mm -hmm. signed up as well. And yeah. so seeing this get some traction <laughs> and, you know, mm -hmm. change often happens in local communities first. But I believe that the job of a member of Congress is to support the local leaders and to make sure that they have the resources that they need. And so I'm very excited about where this UBI conversation is going. And, you know, if I'm lucky enough to get to Congress in 2021, I will definitely be a strong advocate for doing pilot programs around the country so that we can see exactly what this is, how it benefits people, and what are some of the pros and cons? Let's just, you know, let's be honest about all the information that we get. But I'm very excited about this. And so um, I want to thank you for being here today, Scott. And, oh, wait a minute. I want to share some answers that people gave. Oh, right. yeah. So, yes, yeah, I know. This is great. Some people yeah. said... I would take classes to find a better job. Wow. I would put that money back into the economy. I would pay student loans. And mm -hmm. I remember I was at a hangout with the um, Yang Gang last week and I asked the question and, some, and this woman said, she said she has a son who has autism, who's an adult. And every now and again, he runs out into the street and she said, I would buy a fence <laughs> with a lock so that we can mm -hmm. keep our son safe. Someone said, I would use it to start my food business. Someone ah. I would save up for a house. I mean, listen to these things, right? right. And these are things that people want to do. And that's why I like the idea of the universal, the universal part. The people who need it most should absolutely have it. But I think that as we talk about some of the things that we can all use, I think there, there, there's, a, there's a good argument for it. I would give money to my friends to pay their mortgage. I would oh. pay off the healthcare bills. I mean, listen to what people are saying. I mean, I think this is a really interesting conversation. And so look at the ways that people would use $1,000 a month. It's not wasteful. It's nothing negative. And I just think that this is one of those types of ideas, especially given where we are right now and where this economy is going, that maybe it's time. Maybe it's time to at least consider it across the country. I hope that by the end of this year, we have you know 50 cities that have signed up that want to be part of this mayor's initiative. I hope yep. we already have base income going at an emergency level. We do, <laughs> right? This year. We do actually. You know, it's really funny. That, I, was, I was I was at a forum and I said that. I said in many ways we're we're doing a form of UBI as is. That's absolutely true. Yeah, I mean, if we can do a recurring cash payment to everybody, <laughs> that would be the hugest base income pilot ever. Yeah, and and also too, I think the thing about this too is that doing that is going to address so many structural issues because we had this huge buffet of social issues that we want to deal with that are structural, but this in many ways can address many of them. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, I want to thank my guests for yeah. being here, Scott. Thank you for being with us. And now that I thank have you. your contact information, you will probably be hearing for me from me more often <laughs> than not. And it is always, <laughs> always a pleasure to have my mayor on. And just so you guys know, you know, right now in America, mayors are getting it done and black female mayors are really getting it done. And every time I see my mayor on national TV representing for my city, I am so incredibly proud because she is the leader that we need right now at this time. So with that said, I'm Marilyn Strickland, candidate for Congress in the 10th district of Washington state. It would be my honor to represent you and thank you for joining us this evening for a conversation about universal basic income. Good night. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you.